You are listening to the Effective Statistician Podcast, a weekly podcast with Alexander Schacht and Benjamin Pieske, designed to help you reach your potential, lead great science and serve patients without becoming overwhelmed by work. Today we are talking, you won't believe it, about Taylor Swift and visualizations. Does that seem like a very, very unreasonable thing? I thought so as well, but then I read this really, really interesting LinkedIn post and I was laughing out loud, but it really made a lot of sense. So stay tuned for this really, really interesting interview. This interview is with yet another one that I met on LinkedIn. It becomes a little bit of a common theme here. Uh, but if you are not yet there on LinkedIn, then head over and follow me on LinkedIn. I'm producing this podcast in association with PSI, a community dedicated to leading and promoting the use of statistics within the healthcare industry for the benefit of patients. Join PSI today to further develop your statistical capabilities with access to the video on demand content library, free registration to all PSI webinars and much, much more. Head over to the PSI website at psiweb.org to learn more about PSI activities and become a PSI member today. Welcome. Today we are talking about visualization and we are talking about Taylor Swift, which seems to be a little bit of an unusual combination. But we, before we talk about uh, Taylor, we would like to, to talk about Nick. So, Nick, welcome to the uh, the podcast episode here. Maybe Thank you, you very much. Introduce yourself a little bit. Thank you, Alexander. So, my name's Nick Lothorp, and I am currently research and enterprise analyst working at the University of Hull, where I'm working to establish some some processes around how we use data to inform our decision making, and a little bit of what comes with that is that I love data visualization. I love trying to communicate with data and understand how I can improve not only how I communicate with data, but also help other people to think about what they do and, and how they can improve too. So that's just a little bit about me. Okay. Okay. And so recently I came across a really nice post that you wrote on LinkedIn about uh, Taylor Swift. So, so, how did that come about? So I am a, a secret Taylor Swift fan. Um, I don't mind. I don't mind admitting that. Um, I like a little bit of cheesy pop music now and again. Um, and Actually, I've, me too. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Who doesn't? I'm, I'm sure if you ask most people, I'm, I'm sure they'd agree secretly. Um, but I was having a little think about sort of the different facets of, of data visualization. And I think one of the things for me is to sort of reduce ink, reduce clutter, that are within visualizations and um, just to sort of draw eye to things that the eye should be drawn to when you, when you visualize something. And I'm th I was thinking a lot about the blank space within a data visualization. And what do I hear? I sat here and Taylor Swift singing in my head because unashamedly, I know all of the lyrics to the song. <laughs> it was just kind of blank space. And as the song started playing in my head, some of the lyrics started to jump out at me. So I thought, oh, that's interesting. Maybe, maybe Taylor Swift is actually a part-time data visualization freelancer. Maybe, yeah. maybe this song's a little bit about a data visualization practices. Um, and it, that's kind of how it started. So let's talk about the, the, um, the lyrics a little bit. So it starts with Sherry Lips, Crystal Skies, I Could Show You Incredible Things. Now, of course, my voice is not that as nice as Taylor's, but, but <laughs> what were your thoughts when you were listening to these uh, lyrics? See, that this is, for me, kind of the main thing that I almost fall upon when I'm producing data visualizations. And the idea of cherry lips and crystal skies is a little bit about having a blank canvas, a nice decluttered blank canvas, and the cherry lips is that splash of color that... I guess if you was to, to look at, you would be drawn to. Um, I think a lot of the time when we think about data visualization, we think of these big sprawling infographics that are absolutely covered in colors and all the colors of the rainbow are there. 
or we think about the opposite end and we think about these kind of boring gray graphs that are just in black and white, maybe the default colors on, on Microsoft Excel. Um, for me, color is a, a considered design choice. I think if you ever, ever use color in a data visualization, it should be done purposefully. Mm-hmm. It should be done to, to draw the eye. It should be done to, to make a connotation with something, to inspire a feeling. Um, for example, I know this is something that's very sort of UK or, or Western centric, but the association between red is bad or, or stop and, and green is good or green to go, for example. So using colors in that way is, is a great way to, to convey connotation with any data visualizations. Yeah, completely agree with that. And um, in terms of colors, actually for designing visualizations, one of my preferred colors is gray. Because yeah. you can have kind of all different shades of gray in the background and through that have kind of different visual layers. And depending on if your kind of overall bra- uh, background is black or white, yeah, so, so, so if you have white backgrounds and, you know, the lighter gray is, you know, uh, more in the background and, and the darker gray or black is more in the foreground. And then having maybe just, you know, this... Red, yeah, like the um, <laughs> so like the, the cherry. cherry lips. <laughs> <laughs> there, there is a point where people, um, which stands out, yeah, so, so exactly, yeah. exactly, yeah, because I think the absence of bright color is just as powerful as using bright color, mm. and completely agree. Gray, is such a brilliant color to use, because if you're, as an example, if you're plotting a, a complicated time series with with lots of, of data series present on there, uh, it can get messy quite quickly, like rainbow spaghetti. Um, yeah. And I think if you want to just pick one or two of those series out, you can just color the rest of them in a light gray. And like you said, they immediately sit at the background. The present is a reference point, but then your eyes are naturally drawn towards whichever you choose to color. And it, it draws the audience's eye to where you want it to go. Yeah, I've seen that very good use, for example, in some of the COVID data, where you yes. see kind of the natural death rate over a year, yeah, for yeah. different uh, years in the background, so let's say 99, 98, 97, and so on. And these are all grayed out. And then so you get a kind of feeling, okay, yeah, there's kind of a trend over, over the year. Yeah, yes. in, in winter, there's more deaths than in summer. And then you see kind of 2020 and you see this kind of spike and how it differs from uh, all the others. And that, for example, if you would have, you know, the standard Excel colors and everything is, you know, colored. Yeah. yeah, It gets really cluttered. It's good that you've seen that with COVID data. Um, And whoever has produce those graphs should probably speak to our BBC news team in the UK because I think it maybe it was a BBC thing. <laughs> oh, I've seen the well actually sorry BBC news presented but it's actually the official UK government's office for national statistics produced a graph on covid data and it was a similar graph from the start of 2020 and they'd plot covid case rates a moving seven day average but they'd partition the data into age ranges so there was approximately 10, I think, age ranges present on screen, all coloured in all colours of the rainbow. And this was on screen for about 10 seconds. So as soon as that graph splashes to like, you've got 10 seconds to try and understand what the hell is going on with that graph before they'd moved on to the next slide on TV. And I think the main takeaway that, that I took from it was that there were spikes in the younger age population so they could have coloured, they could have taken the sort of bundle of age ranges that sat on the lower side of the graph and coloured them grey and then coloured the younger age ranges and highlighted, look, it, it seems to be in the UK that people under the age of 30 are experiencing a much higher case rate. But instead, it was just a mess of, I like to call it rainbow spaghetti, because yeah. you're trying to sort of untangle it and, and work out exactly what's going on. Yeah. So let's go to the next l- lyrics. Find out what you want. Be that girl for a month. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I kind of like to hope that when you find out what somebody wants, you would you would be that girl for longer than a month. Um, but f- 
for me, my background um, is predominantly in engineering and particularly in project engineering um, and working a little bit in project management before moving into, into data. So for me, user requirements are a huge thing, a huge thing in engineering before you even get started on, on whatever it is that you're producing. Mm-hmm. always establish what the user wants. And I've kind of seen anecdotally from working around other data projects that this doesn't always happen. It's quite easy for, for data products to be developed by the, the person producing them, but necessarily without working out what's, what's being asked for. Um, and I'm guilty of this. Um, I can share a story. Um, when I produced my very first set of dashboards, um, I was quite junior. I had access to a data warehouse full of all kinds of, of data. And we were, I worked in a program office overseeing around 25 different project teams. So I was tasked with producing dashboards for each of these teams, largely the same. So it was really just kind of produce one dashboard and with slight differences, they could be rolled out across all 25 teams. So I immediately just jumped straight into that task produced the dashboards, pulled all of these fancy, wonderful metrics out, presented them all. There were pie charts and line graphs and bar charts. Um, after about a month of rolling that out, nobody was using them. Nobody. Yeah. I'd not bothered to take the time to sit with any of these teams and work out actually what metrics are useful for you. If you were to have a dashboard, what things would you like to see? that would actually be useful to you or actually would a dashboard even be useful because sometimes they're not, they're just, you know, they're, they're just getting, well, they're just there and, and they're never used. Um, I never took the time to work any of that out. And so they ended up in the data graveyard as many of these projects do. Yeah. Um, I think that just kind of taking the time to, to understand what your stakeholders want and produce something accordingly and being able to challenge that because sometimes people ask for things that they think they want, but the reality is that they want something else. Yep. It's, it's really important to understand the why. Yeah. Yes. So if they say, I would like to have a pie chart here. Yeah. That yes. is like you going in, driving your garage, uh, your car into a garage and then telling the mechanics exactly what they should do. Yeah. Yes, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> that is a good analogy. It's it's completely weird, yeah. So, yeah. so and then I always ask about okay, what do you need this pie chart for? Yeah. yeah. What what's the decision? Um, and then why is this a decision important? What what are what would be the consequences? What other factors do you consider in this decision? Yeah. yeah. And uh, through these kind all these kind of different further questions, you much better understand what is the real underlying need. Uh, yes. Is there anything missing? Yeah, no, I completely agree. And I think that's something that comes with experience because I think the first time that you sit, particularly if you work with senior stakeholders and if you're relatively junior, it's quite easy that if if your boss says to you, I'd like to see some pie charts, you're going to go in and put some pie charts on there and not question that. In retrospect, you're entirely right. There, you, If you're the sort of the the technical or the one with the domain and, and technical knowledge, you should be the one that actually decides what the product should should look like in a sense. They should be telling you what, what they want out of it. Yeah. Just like you wouldn't go to a mechanic and, and tell them what to do. You yeah. just you want a car that works and let the mechanic figure out what's happening under the hood. Exactly. And then if if they want a pie chart and you think mm-hmm. I'm not sure the pie chart is really the best option. Usually not. (laughs) (laughs) not. Um, Sometimes I think it's really good to then, you know, show the pie chart. Oh, this is what you ask for. And I have also this nice um, uh, bar chart or lollipop graph or whatsoever here. um, that I think uh, could be also quite useful or could work instead. Yeah. Yeah. And then you can explain. They see the difference and then maybe, you know, this yeah. was a better one. <laughs> so, something resembling a, a minimal viable product is great for that kind of thing because you can kind of gauge what they're asking for and see if you can steer the discussion. And if they still insist, well, no, I'd like to see a pie chart. So then you go away and you produce a super quick mock-up, a concept of, like, okay, this is what you've asked for. I've also prepared an alternative. What do you think of this? Um, and that's 
another way to kind of influence the direction of, of the data product, produce a few knockups, a few concepts. Yeah. Yeah. Let them see what they're looking at. And actually they may, they may change their mind. Yeah. That leads us actually to the next lyrics. So it's going to be forever or it's going to do, go down in flames. <laughs> I really love it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's just a little bit about, you hear this statistic option eh, often around sort of data projects, often around machine learning and, and artificial intelligence, but I suppose they can be applied to sort of more broader sort of data projects in sort of business intelligence and dashboarding. But you hear that roughly 80% of, of data projects fail and there are myriad reasons why that is and, and collecting correct user requirements is, is one aspect of that. Um, so that's just kind of a little perk at the fact that you've got this exasperated data scientist or data professional that's that's producing yet another model or data product or dashboard or something that they feel like probably will just get cast aside or terminated. And so this is this is the one they want to see this put in or they're going to walk, they're going to leave. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, and I think usually it doesn't go down in flames. Usually it probably more dies very, very slowly over. Very, very slowly, without even so much as a whimper. Yeah, 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 yeah. But it, no, it, nobody even knows. You would ask. It's the kind of thing that if you then did a sort of a survey to try and evaluate afterwards, or you tried to, and you would speak to people, and they would just kind of, if they were being honest, they would say, oh, we've not used it. <laughs> I think it's actually quite good to have some kind of metrics in the dashboard. Yeah. That Uh, show you kind of what's used, how it's used, and, and how often it's used, who uses it, and, and things like this. Yeah. Because um, if it should be there forever, yeah, it probably needs constant, constant kind of uh, yes. updates and things like this. Yeah. And so I think, uh, you know, like a relationship, yeah, you need to constantly <laughs> work on it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. It, it, it's never kind of 100% uh, percent stable. Yeah, the, the people change um, and, uh, you know, the, the requirements change, the environment change. Uh, yeah. Everything is kind of changing all the time. Yeah. And so um, you need to constantly kind of see what works, what doesn't work. Are there new requirements? Are there any changes? And so I think it's really good to have some kind of maintenance strategy directly. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. And, and even in a static environment, which is never the case, but even if you assume a static environment, if you don't work on it, then you're assuming that you've got it completely perfect in the first place. And that tends to not be the case because there'll be things on there that become redundant and actually nobody finds useful or it's not giving the right information. So you can't assume that you've got it right. You should iterate. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, actually, I think it's it's not even desirable to be perfect in the first place. No. Because I think visualization is always iterative, always. Yes. And it's, you know, um, because you can never actually kind of assume every and each kind of data scenario. Yeah. And so there's always kind of things that, that, that will change. And yeah. uh, there's, you know, so there's a new product that you uh, include and then you have, you know, that has kind of different data or whatsoever. And then, then you need to account for that. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So I think that is a really, really good, good thing. So, and if that you want to, have it really adopted widely, you also need to invest quite a lot in basically selling it to people. Yes. Yes, absolutely. And I think, what's the word? Being a, being a strong advocate for your products, I think the point in which you someone may finish producing some kind of data product, data visualization, be it dashboard or whatever, and they wash their hands of it and say, I've done my bit, and I pass it on to the user is probably where that's going to die a death. Yeah. yeah. You almost need to be this long-term customer support function where you are the advocate of this product 
and you're pushing it, you're trying to find user use cases, you're trying to get feedback on that. And, and, it, and it, it does, it, it does need that. It, it needs you to sell it. It needs you to live it and help sort of embed it because it, you're introducing a change. If you're trying to introduce a data product like a dashboard, you're introducing a change and people tend to be, and especially teams, tend to be naturally resistant to that. And yeah. this is where the communication piece comes in. You need to live and breathe that product and, and sell it consistently until yeah. it's business as usual for them to be to be either using it or they have a legitimate reason why they're not using it, in which case, back to the drawing board. Yeah, absolutely. It's kind of this, you need to basically handle it like any other change mm. project. Yes. Yeah? So you need to see, okay, who are the early adopters? Do yeah. they have kind of some nice success stories that you can share with? Yeah. Who are kind of senior stakeholders that you want to have on your side that maybe, you know, uh, speak about it and, and sh say it's great and please use it. Um, um, have you included someone in the development that yeah. basically can then stand in front of their peers and say, here, this is what I developed together with Nick and it, it really helps me to uh, do much better my work. Here's, here's how I'm using it and things like this. It's much better than you as the analyst going into the room and saying, hey, I have this great new dashboard here and yeah. now you all will love it. And <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Which is exactly what I did with my <laughs> 25 <laughs> dashboards. Um, and these were two engineers that had been in their career for 20 or 30 years thinking, well, I've never had to use this before, so why should I use it now? Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> It's completely the same for me. And, and at the beginning of my career, I can also think about a couple of instances where I came with these For my area, of course, I was thinking brilliant ideas and, you know, yeah. all the facts that speak for this is what we need to do and just basically ran into a break of walls. <laughs> that's it. That's it. And, and that's, I think that's equally where your sort of sales and, and communication part is, is so useful because even before you get to the point where you're presenting your final product, if you have new ideas, it, It's all about how you sell them to people and bring them on, get them on board with the idea. Yeah. yeah. So let's go to the next line. But I've got a blank space, baby, and I'll write your name. <laughs> <laughs> so this is all about Taylor's big mistake. So she's produced this brilliant dashboard um, with plenty of blank space, and then she just decides to write her name in there. And that's unnecessary because we know Taylor Swift. Everyone knows Taylor Swift. She's a celebrity. So if Taylor Swift presents you with a dashboard, you don't need to know her name. You don't need to see it on the dashboard. It's redundant information. It's clutter. It's ink that is potentially detracting from the message. And for me, I am always, my priority when designing any visualization, regardless of what it is, is about speed to comprehension. Mm-hmm. For me, I always want to simplify to the point where every element has been designed such that it can be understood as quickly as possible. And that's just a function of some of the environments I've worked in previously um, in, in national security. Um, it was less about producing dashboards, but more about producing briefs for, for senior government, for sometimes for ministers. And they would use these. This would help inform rapid decision making. So every design choice was about increasing speed to uh, re removing the get my words out, decreasing speed to comprehension, um, and so part of that is about being absolutely ruthless with clutter. Um, it's a big thing for me. Um, things like grid lines, I often think, and this is just such a, a small example, but grid lines on a graph for me unless you're running your finger from a y-axis along to track what values are, unless someone is going to do that, you don't need a grid line in my opinion because yeah. people are usually just interested with a trend or the broad strokes. And by nature of data visualization anyway, you lose some of the precision in your data because you're not presenting raw values. You're presenting trends. You're presenting a visual encoding of data. So for me, things like, grid lines 
or, or clutter, black, heavy, black axes, X and Y axes with values, I often try to make them, this goes back to colour, a more muted grey colour. Mm-hmm. So your eye isn't drawn to the axes, but it's drawn to what the axes frame. All these little small design considerations. So hopefully what you're left with is this perfect perfect sort of data to ink ratio where the ink that remains there is presenting what you want people to see. Yeah. And it's, you know, all these, all these little pieces, like, you know, it's the tick mark. See, yes. you know, that you have four different fonts on your dashboard. And, yeah. that, you know, that, uh, so make also in terms of aligning things, yeah, so, mm-hmm. so that it's not kind of, it looks like um, your kid's playground, yeah, where there's everything scattered across the, <laughs> the floor, yeah. but it, it looks kind of nicely organized, yeah, yeah. And, and there's, uh, there's nice kind of, you know, visual lines in there. These doesn't need to be kind of actual lines, but it's arranged kind of aligned vertically or horizontally and then these kind of things. Yeah. it's in, When I post on LinkedIn about data visualization, I usually try to focus on one small component with each post. In a vacuum, that one small component can seem completely insignificant. And I often get a few messages of people kind of asking, is that really important? And I guess if you just look at that one individual design choice, Mm -hmm. probably not. But for me, effective data visualization is the amalgamation of many, many, many small design choices. And if you actually take a before and after of two different visualizations, and one is just something that's thrown together without much thought to it, and the other has had these many design considerations made to try and optimize this speed to comprehension. You find that, yeah, okay, this one individual change is, insignif- is seemingly insignificant, and this one is, but you put them all together, the difference can be huge. Yeah. There's a really nice example by um, Cole Nussbaumann Nafleck on her storytelling <clears throat> with Data Side, um, yeah. where she has a very cluttered. Excel uh, dashboard or uh, not not a dashboard, just just a graph. Yeah, and then has I think something like twenty different minor steps. Yeah, and yeah. each minor step doesn't make a big difference. Yeah, yeah, but all of them together is a huge difference. Yeah, yeah. so, so yeah. Um, and that's I think yeah, and uh, and of course there's things that have have a bigger impact like. Um, reducing uh, 20 different colors to just one, yeah, and yeah. Then putting everything else in, in, in gray, that's a big effect. And then, you know, but but as you said, you know, the putting uh, lines on a, on a X axis or Y axis uh, into gray and, and make it thinner, it's just a small thing, but, but yeah. it also has an effect. Yeah. 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 Yeah, yeah definitely. <laughs> That's really good. How is your experience in terms of over time? Do you see that kind of there's additional clutter coming up over time? Uh, in what a sense? With, 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 with my own work or if I see what other people do? Both, yeah. Ooh, interesting question. Um, with experience over time, I guess if you was to plot a graph of how much ink I use in data visualizations, um, it would resemble kind of a U shape mm-hmm. where I started out producing these very busy, busy dashboards or busy graphs. And then I reached a super minimal point where I tried to remove almost too much mm-hmm. point where you had this very minimal graph that actually needed something a little extra to be able to actually to, to comprehend. Um, and I think I've arrived for me at a happy medium. Um, obviously data visualization is is subjective so you don't always you don't always hit the mark um and i think it, it needs you to be critical of your own work to understand what worked and, and what didn't work but i think for me i've reached a point where i think you have you kind of you remove clutter but then you have useful additional link and for me that'll come in the form of annotation often so that a graph in isolation has something that, alongside it to sort of help explain the context. If that's 
something like a dashboard or a graph in a report, that's great. You can you can annotate that directly. Um, if it was in a presentation, I would probably avoid that and keep it super minimal. But then it's almost like I'm annotating it with voice. Yes. Providing this very simple graphic for people to, to focus on in a live setting, but use my own words to provide the context. So it, it, it varies. Um, I think when I kind of look around at what, what other people are producing, I think it, it varies. And I'm not saying I'm right. Obviously, again, it's, it's such a subjective, such a, a subjective area. But I think there's often a lot of focus on cramming so much information and making these dashboards as dense as possible when really like it shouldn't be about it should be about trying to sort of keep it to the the top three to five kind of metrics kpis that you're interested in lots of blank space make it something that someone can look at and see what they need to know very quickly rather than have to navigate very dense graphs and lines of data and charts and all sorts yeah i Uh, I think the annotation point is really good. So yeah. when I saw, for example, the John Hopkins dashboard, yes. yeah, at the beginning there was pretty much no annotation, just some legal uh, disclaimers. Yeah. And over the time they added more and more kind of additional information about where the data is coming from, what are the limitations, what are the strengths. And so that made it much easier then to understand why there are certain data points maybe looking a little bit weird or, or all these kind of different things. Yeah. And uh, that was, I think, really, really helpful. And that speaks to, you know, you may need to add a little bit clutter over time based yes. on your learnings. And yeah, absolutely. Especially also for uh, dashboards, you can have then these hover over functions and things yes. that that is, you know, if you just look at it, it's not distracting, but if you want to dig a little bit deeper into it, you get this additional information. Yeah. And I think the, the interesting thing about annotations is there's two layers to that. The first layer is that you can give additional contextual information to aid understanding. But the second part to it, and it's one you have to be careful with because you can imagine a scenario where it can be abused, but it gives you, the presenter of data, the opportunity to add your influence to it. So as someone that's maybe done the analysis or that's that's produced some kind of data product, your annotation can be a way to help lead the audience towards a particular conclusion. Again, it's something that has to be considered because you could see how that could be abused especially with something like covid cases and and things like that that like you could see how a graph of that with some unethical annotation could try and lead people towards something completely false but in other settings you can see how it's completely legitimate yeah. if you're the person that's close to the data and you've seen something that you think is a genuine insight that needs discussion for a decision to be made you should have absolutely put your opinion across. It doesn't matter if it's right or wrong. You want to foster a discussion around it. Yeah. Between yeah. people who are going to make decisions. So I think annotation is an opportunity for you to add your own opinion to something, whether that's right or wrong. But again, proceed with caution. <laughs> I, I, I think it's pretty valuable very often. Yeah, mm -hmm. so I think um, as a data scientist, as a statistician, um, you have a much better feeling of data that yeah. many people that don't deal with data all the time don't have. Yeah. yeah. And not giving your opinion, your, your, your perception, not giving your experience into it, I think is usually a disservice. Yes. Yeah? Of course, it can be perceived as biasing, yeah. but I think it's, it's actually a service because then people can understand where you're coming from and see points yeah. that maybe they don't see yeah, because yeah. they don't have the experience. They don't understand kind of variation and these kind of things. And so that, or maybe the model behind it and model assumptions. Yeah. And yeah. so um, putting that additional in there, I think is really, really helpful. Usually. Yeah. And of course, you know, you need to make, make it clear and transparent that this is your opinion and your uh, your experience that comes into play here. Yeah, and, and I, I guess in some ways, to use your car analogy from earlier, if you took a car into a mechanic with a problem 
And then the mechanic turned around and said, so here's the problem. And I'm going to give you three different ways that I can fix this. And I'm going to let you make the decision. And then you as the non-mechanic sat there and think, right, yeah. okay. Like you would expect the mechanic to give some input. In, exactly. my, in my experience, this, this is what I think is the best way to proceed. However, you know, and, and that's entirely what you would expect. Yeah. yeah. You're right. It's a disservice to just sort of wash your hands and, and, and leave the decision to, to other people who are perhaps not as close to the data or, or not as experienced. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, completely agree. I would, yeah. I would probably turn back and say to the car mechanic, "What would you do if that would yeah. be your car?" <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So, last question: How do you measure the success of your visualization? So, for Taylor, it's pretty easy to measure success. Since yeah. it's seen on her following and on her <laughs> bank account, probably, yeah. and, and uh, these kind of things, but. but How do, you, how do you measure success of a visualization? This is a, this is a difficult question for me because I think some aspects of it feel a little intangible. And I guess you can break down the different ways that you would measure success. So when I think about back when I was producing reporting material in government, I didn't have any direct feedback on what worked and what didn't work, but what I could gauge was opinion before and after. And if what I had presented had any effect on prevailing opinion, for example, um, that's not necessarily an indicator of, might be, it might be an indicator of the effectiveness of the data visualization, maybe not the underlying message itself. Um, for something like a dashboard, I would want to think about operationally how am I improving the metrics that I am displaying? Mm -hmm. So the, the metrics are being displayed for a reason because they need to be monitored, they need to be observed over time. And the hope is that in doing so, you would see improvements. For example, if it's a sales metric, if it's various sales metrics, you would hope that the sales team are taking action based on the information they're receiving. And that should hopefully translate to a net positive. But for me, it seems such a multi-variable problem that it's, it's hard to understand and get a handle on how you quantify that improvement that you, that you visualize into wrong. I'd be interested in hearing what you think about that because it's something that plagues me. Yeah, I, I think um, I'd always look into two different ways. Yeah, so yeah. one is looking into, of course, the quantitative data from the yeah. dashboard. How many people are actually using it and, and things like this. But at least as important is the user feedback. Yeah, yeah. So, so really kind of talking with users and, and seeing kind of how, how does it help them? Do they have, you know... Do they have any recommendations on it? Um, do they recommend it to their peers? Yeah, so yeah. It's, it's a little bit like, do you get a five-star review with a nice comment? <laughs> 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 yeah, so um, yeah. that is, I would say, at least as important as, you know, the, the, the usage data, I would say. Yeah, and I think that's, Yeah, that's absolutely right. And I think when you think about things like dashboards or sort of long-standing data visualization products like dashboards, I think that's such such a good way um, to, to sort of get some feedback. I think it becomes more difficult for kind of those single use or yep. time visual yep. in the context of a presentation or a single report that's, that exists for almost for a single point in time. Um, and again, without asking for feedback, um, it's difficult. It's something I've thought about quite a bit and I don't have an answer for it. So the other point is how does, if, if, it's, if it's a single report, yeah? yeah, and you work with this person again and again and again, yeah. is he or she coming back to you and says, I would like to have something again? Yes. Now that is... Yes. That's a success. Yeah. 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 If, if she never comes back to you, that was probably not. <laughs> yeah. 
and 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 similarly i think that's where my sort of view on kind of the change of opinion comes in i think it's because most of my visualization work has been less about qualitative or sorry quantitative metrics are more about guiding opinion or guiding decision i think if i've been successful in that and i've been able to guide prevailing opinion towards a recommendation that feels like success to me whereas i feel like if i'd have produced 10 data products and then the direction of the decision was contrary to my recommendation all 10 times i think i'm probably doing something wrong there <laughs> yeah yeah and maybe not with the visualization but actually just my underlying assumptions and 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 underlying analysis probably something wrong there yeah, so it's, it's a little bit like coming back to Taylor Swift. Yeah, if, if the relationships <laughs> improved and you see that, you know, you get along very, very nicely and you get a yeah. lot of positive feedback, then, yeah, you're yeah. going to be there forever. Otherwise, you're going to flames. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So, Nick, any final, uh, final thoughts on this topic? Um. My only final thought that I have is is really around people who do data visualization. And I think it's something that's so important because you hear the word data and your first assumption is, well, this doesn't, if you don't work with data, if you're not a statistician, data scientist, data analyst, and you hear the word data visualization, your immediate assumption is this does not apply to me, probably. But actually, a huge amount of people work with data data on a daily basis these could be people in hr these could be people in finance sales marketing maybe not you know doing heavy analyses and and that kind of thing but people will at some point invariably interact with data maybe have to produce a few graphs a few charts and understanding the kind of principles that we've spoken about today could be so important for these people to improve how they present data It's no different to how you present words when you write an email out and you think about the words that you're using because you want to convey a particular message. And yet the idea of then just producing a bar chart in Excel and leaving it with all of its default settings, you should apply the same kind of sort of depth to that yep. and, and communicate and, and think about communication. So I think data visualization is a skill, especially as we, we grow to, 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 collect and consume so much more data is so important for a great many people that wouldn't identify as a data professional. Yeah. Yeah. Completely agree. It's a, it's a very important piece in the overall data literacy puzzle. Yeah. I would say. And I know you need to see that as an example is Taylor Swift is an international pop star and even she is a data visualization professional. Exactly. Thanks so much for these Thank great words. We talked about lots of, lots of different things. And you, next time, if you listen to Taylor Swift, maybe you talk, you know, think about blank space and decluttering and what do you see your stakeholders think about it and <laughs> will it improve your relationships with them and, and, um, will you have it, you know, updated and work on it and sell, uh, sell it all the time? So, I for sure will now always think about it <laughs> when I hear that song. So thanks so much, Nick, for this awesome interview. Thank you for you, Alexander, for having me as well. And I hope I haven't ruined Blank Space, the song for you. <laughs> this show was created in association with PSI. And I hope that you maybe not just a fan of Taylor, but also a fan of this podcast. And if you like it, please tell your colleagues about it. This show was created in association with PSI and thanks to Rain who helps with the show in the background. Thank you for listening. Reach your potential, lead great science and serve patients. Just be an effective statistician.